Good morning and uh, welcome to the City of Toronto's COVID-19 media briefing for Tuesday, January the 25th, 2022. Joining us today is Toronto Mayor John Tory, Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen Devilla, and Toronto Fire Chief and Incident Commander for COVID-19, Matthew Pegg. Mayor Tory. Well, good morning. Uh, we're continuing to make a great progress helping residents get vaccinated against COVID-19. The first Toronto case of a largely unknown and deadly virus was reported in Toronto exactly two years ago today. I want to acknowledge the real tragedy and the loss and the illness that this virus has brought to literally thousands of families inside the City of Toronto over those two years. I think the best thing we can do to help to bring a degree of comfort but also to bring the pandemic to an end is to continue the work that we have been doing as a city uh, within our mandate to help uh, to bring the pandemic to an end. And since that day two years ago, every element of what has come to be known as Team Toronto, led by the people of Toronto themselves, that team has worked nonstop together and effectively and including together with the other governments to handle an often rapidly changing health crisis as well as anywhere in the world, much as we know that there is lots left for us to do. Top of the list, Team Toronto has worked nonstop to help residents get vaccinated. And we now have more than 90% of the residents 12 years and older with at least their first dose of vaccine. And in the face of the threat from the Omicron variant, we ramped up vaccination capacity and have ensured that more than 55.5% of eligible residents already have their third dose. It was great to see this progress in action at the Vax the Northwest Clinic on Sunday at York University where almost 1,700 residents came out to get vaccinated. I want to thank everyone who worked on this effort to get residents in the Northwest some help to get themselves vaccinated. We heard this morning on our strategic COVID table call that 51% of those who attended were walk-ins. That is a great turnout and a credit to the strong outreach effort in the community by the community itself. I want to again thank the team who made the event possible. It's a long list, but that's because Team Toronto is a big team. Toronto Public Health, Humber River Hospital, University Health Network, who, for example, moved the entire pharmacy a function from downtown to the northwest for that day. Black Creek Community Health Center, Unison Community Health Center. They uh, supplied a lot of the people that went out and were trusted to bring uh, people, local residents, to the vaccination clinic. Tennis Canada and York University, who are our hosts, and the TTC, who did a great job with buses. They contributed to the cause to get people, hundreds of people, to the vaccine clinic. Our work to help everyone, everywhere, without exception, to have access continues. Uh, and that is for first, second, third doses and for children. This morning, we have opened up 4,167 new COVID-19 vaccine appointments for this Sunday and Monday at the city-run vaccination clinics. And so those can be accessed in the usual manner through the provincial booking system, uh, which can be most easily reached through toronto.ca. If you need your first, second or third dose, please sign up for these appointments and get vaccinated. Dr. Davila will be detailing today the work that Toronto Public Health is doing now to make sure we have hyper-local mobile clinics. We've been doing this throughout, but we're going to be having a renewed focus on hyper-local hyper mobile clinics, offering third doses in areas where we know that vaccination rates are low and that we need to get them up higher. The leadership of Team Toronto, including the three of us, remain absolutely determined that no Torontonian will be left behind and our renewed focus on hyperlocal reflects our recognition of the challenge that we face in delivering safe vaccine protection to often marginalized populations in our city. And that work continues day in and day out. I'm proud to announce today that we'll be hosting another super supportive and accessible COVID-19 vac vaccination clinic next week. The clinic will be held on Monday, January the 31st, from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 8 o'clock at night at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. The City of Toronto, in partnership with the Accessibility Task Force on COVID-19 vaccines, will be hosting a vaccination clinic for individuals with disabilities. Organizations such as Silent Voice, Balance for Blind Adults, and the Canadian Centre for Caregiving Excellence will be on site to provide supports and accommodations alongside Toronto Public Health. The clinic will be open to anyone born in 2016 or earlier for first, second or third doses. Moderna will be available for those aged 30 plus and Pfizer for those aged 5 to 29. 
This is a physically accessible clinic location, which is meant to fully accommodate those with mobility and other challenges facing them, including individuals who have a fear of needles, those who need a quiet space to get vaccinated or someone to sit down while waiting, those who need a companion with them as they get vaccinated, or those, for example, who need an ASL interpreter. This super supportive clinic is one of many we have worked on with the Accessibility Task Force to operate throughout the COVID-19 vaccination effort, and I want to thank the task force for working with us to make these clinics possible, including the one, as mentioned again, Monday, January 31st at the Metropolitan Toronto Convention Centre, and again, that information is available on toronto.ca. As you've heard me say before, I'm very proud of the work the City continues to do in modernizing and digitizing service delivery. The past two years in particular have demonstrated both the necessity and the convenience of digital options. Modernization of services is good for everyone. Greater choice and convenience for residents, cost savings for the city. People want simple and modern digital options. We know Toronto residents and businesses and visitors want and need better and more efficient digital and self-serve options that are easy to use and available on the device and on the channel and at the time of their choosing. Today, I'm happy to announce the launch of the 311 Toronto mobile app, part of our improved 311 Toronto service experience. It now makes it even easier to access 311 Toronto. 311 Toronto is the front door gateway to city information, to programs, and to services. And of course, it will continue to be available to Torontonians in the way that they're accustomed to through the phone, through email, through the web, and on social media. But now we have added an app. You have the choice as to how you wish to use uh, any of these channels to connect with 311, any service, any device, any channel. You may recall that last November when we launched the new and improved 311 online experience, a modern upgraded web platform offering, offering more choice and enhanced services for users. Now, all the great features of that new platform are available right at your fingertips on your phone. And so, for example, uh, people will be able to use the app to create a service request for any of the more than 600 different services 311 provides. They will be able to track the request themselves from beginning to end with live status updates sent to their personal device. They'll be able to have a live chat with a 311 agent online and many more features like that. There are other extra benefits as well that come with using your mobile device. For instance, you can use your device's camera to take a photo and attach it directly to your service request. That way, the 311 team can see exactly what you see and the issue you need resolved, resulting in even more efficiencies. You can use the GPS on your device to set the exact location of your service request, uh, easily view open requests in your neighborhood that have been submitted by others uh, or yourself, or exploit points of interest uh, near you, such as the civic centers, the libraries, or the museums. So all of this is in the cause of faster and better service that provides greater, cho greater choice and convenience, and that is what this app will bring. Despite the ongoing challenges of the, pa of the pandemic, I'm glad that we've been able to move forward uh, with these kinds of improvements in service delivery and launch this app today for residents so that they can use it right away. Tomorrow is Bell Let's Talk Day. And I look forward to both taking part and also to doing my part to encourage people to talk about mental health. This mental health initiative has helped unite Canadians year after year in the world's biggest conversation about mental health, working to break the stigma around mental illness. I believe that mental health and many associated issues will be one of the defining challenges of the coming years, let alone it being a defining challenge in front of us right now. It's been made worse by the experiences of the pandemic for people of all ages. The state of our collective mental health has declined, including for many young people. And our willingness to talk about it, not just tomorrow, but let's start with tomorrow, our willingness to talk about it and do more to address it, will have a great deal to do with our ability to continue to succeed as a Canadian society, given the terrible toll that mental illness takes on many fronts. I want to thank Chief Pegg in advance of his remarks today for delivering an important message through his remarks on this topic, which are very honest and open. His remarks are, uh, and they're important as a way of starting uh, this conversation. I'd now like to ask Dr. Davila to offer her update for today. Thank you, Mayor Tory, and good morning. Today marks exactly two years since the first case of COVID-19 was reported in Toronto. There is no question that since that Saturday morning, two years ago, 
COVID-19 has brought unprecedented challenges and has affected every facet of our lives. Sadly, we've experienced enormous losses over the past two years. As of January 24th, 3,943 Toronto residents have lost their lives to COVID-19, and thousands more have been admitted to the hospital or to intensive care. I extend my deepest sympathies to all those who've experienced tragedy because of this virus, and my sincere thanks to the healthcare workers, families, and friends who have provided care and support to those in need. This pandemic has had a profound impact on how we have lived our lives. Whether adapting to new ways of working, learning, parenting, or socializing with friends and family, we have been stretched in ways we probably never expected. Still, I also see reasons for hope and optimism. Torontonians have demonstrated an incredible collective strength and resilience. Your commitment to care for each other and to do everything within your power to stop the spread of COVID-19 is inspiring. We have also come a long way in our understanding of COVID-19 and in our ability to respond to it. Thanks to the never ceasing efforts of Toronto Public Health staff, healthcare workers, researchers and scientists, and essential workers across the city, we are in a much better position to fight the spread of COVID-19 than we were two years ago. We have safe and effective vaccines. We know that measures like masking, physical distancing, increasing ventilation, reducing our contacts, and staying home when we're sick all help to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. As we find ourselves in the midst of the Omicron wave, it is clear that these measures are having an impact. Despite record case counts, we are seeing less severe outcomes, especially amongst those who've had three doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And while Omicron may be less severe than the Delta variant, it's clear that vaccines are having an impact. Vaccinated and boosted individuals have been hospitalized and admitted to the ICU at much lower rates than those who are unvaccinated. And since vaccine is one of our most effective tools to reduce the impact of COVID-19, our efforts to vaccinate as many Toronto residents as possible have not stopped for more than a year. When eligibility for third doses expanded in December, we increased our capacity quickly, creating as many vaccination opportunities as possible. This included operating our immunization clinics seven days a week and working with our partners to make vaccines available at community-based clinics, pharmacies, and family doctor's offices across the city. This has been nothing short of remarkable, and my thanks go to all those who helped make this happen. However, our work is not yet done. In the coming weeks, Team Toronto will shift our focus to a data-driven, hyper-local, mobile and pop-up clinic strategy. We are again focusing on local and community-based vaccination opportunities to increase vaccine uptake, particularly for pediatric and third doses in neighbourhoods where vaccination coverage is lower than the Toronto average. I'm sure many of you recall when earlier last year we brought vaccine clinics to malls, to subway stations, places of worship, community centres, workplaces and other community settings. With our Team Toronto partners, we will again focus our efforts 
and resources to returning to these settings and bringing the vaccine to people where they live, work, study, and play. To do this, Toronto Public Health will be roughly doubling our mobile staff resources over the next several weeks. We will continue our focused outreach with 155 community agencies, 410 neighbourhood ambassadors, and hundreds of thousands of phone calls and text messages to support people getting vaccinated. We will also continue our efforts to maximize vaccine uptake amongst 5 to 11 year olds, their families and their households, and those that work in and support schools and childcare settings. In partnership with school boards and schools across Toronto, we will continue to provide school-based clinics both during and after the school day. While our Toronto Public Health Immunization Clinics will remain an important component of our vaccination strategy, providing both booked and increasingly walk-in appointments, we will be shifting some staff and resources to allow us to maximize community and neighbourhood-specific vaccination opportunities. Last week, the province announced plans to begin to loosen some restrictions as of January 31st. As that date approaches and in-person interactions increase, it will be important that we all do our part to increase vaccine coverage and support safe reopening. We've all been through so much over the past two years. Let's reflect on all that we have been through and all that we have learned. Let's protect the progress we've made and together look to the year ahead with optimism and with hope. I'll now turn it over to Chief Pegg to deliver his remarks for today. Thank you, Dr. Davila, and good morning. I'm pleased to report that we are continuing to see a favourable trend across our emergency services with respect to unplanned absences as a result of COVID-19. Over the past three weeks, our unplanned absence rates in both paramedic services and fire services have continued to decrease each week. In fire services, our operating unplanned absence rate has improved from 9.7% during the week of December 23rd to 3.5% to date this week. Likewise, in paramedic services, our operating unplanned absence rate has improved from 19.3% during the week of December 23rd to 7.8% to date this week. This is testament to the effectiveness of the unplanned absence mitigation strategies that each of our city services have been implementing since the outset of the Omicron wave of COVID-19. With all active city staff being fully vaccinated against COVID-19, Toronto has continued to provide emergency, essential and critical services in response to the challenges posed by the pandemic. I would like to once again acknowledge and thank each and every member of our team who continues to report for duty each day, accept extended and overtime shifts as required, and for going above and beyond to ensure the continued delivery of the services that our residents rely on every day. Yesterday, our emergency and essential services operated with an, un an average unplanned absence rate of 7.3%. Between December 24th and January 24th, our emergency and essential services operated with an average unplanned absence rate of 12.1%. From a citywide perspective, yesterday, we operated with an average unplanned absence rate of 5.2% across all the city divisions. Yesterday, Toronto Paramedic Services operated with 120 ambulances on the road and an unplanned absence rate of 7.8%. Also yesterday, Toronto Fire Services operated with all 124 frontline trucks and crews in service and an unplanned absence rate of 3.5%. 
Fire services are continuing to respond to additional low priority paramedic calls each day where there is no clear indication of a patient or injury. Each of our other emergency essential and critical services, including Toronto Police, Toronto Water, TTC, Shelter Support and Housing, Senior Services and Long-Term Care, Children's Services, and our city-operated COVID-19 vaccine clinics also continue to provide exceptional service to Toronto residents, and I thank them also. As the situation with COVID-19 has evolved, so have our planning and response, and this work is continuing every day. In closing today, I would like to acknowledge that tomorrow is Bell Let's Talk Day in support of mental health. Bell Let's Talk is a wide-reaching, multi-year program designed to break the silence around mental illness and support mental health all across Canada. Tomorrow, on Bell Let's Talk Day, Bell will donate even more towards mental health initiatives in Canada by contributing five cents for every applicable text, call, tweet, or TikTok video using the Bell Let's Talk hashtag, social media video view, and each of their Facebook frame or Snapchat lens. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges associated with mental health have increased across our city and beyond. Continuing to do my part and using the public platform that I am afforded as Toronto's Fire Chief to further eliminate the stigma associated with getting professional help to both get healthy and stay healthy is very important to me. Over the course of my life and my career as a first responder, I have witnessed the realities of stress injuries firsthand. I've also seen far too many examples where good people are afraid to speak up, reach out, or seek help when they need it for fear of being stigmatized or looked down on as a result. There is nothing weak about seeking help to maintain your mental health. In fact, from my perspective, this is one of the true indicators of strength. While it often feels like an overused statement, it is okay not to be okay. It is also okay to be okay. The stresses of life, work, and family affect each of us in different ways and at different times. And there is no standardized nor correct response to any particular event or situation. The same situation or event will affect everyone in different ways and at different times. COVID-19 has taken a toll on the mental health of many, as these pressures add to the already often heavy loads being carried by so many of our family members, friends, colleagues, and residents. Ensuring that I continue to remain resilient and strong has been an important factor in maintaining my ability to bring the very best that I have to offer in my role as Fire Chief and as the City of Toronto's Incident Commander for COVID-19 each and every day. In days gone by, it would have been considered a sign of weakness for a fire chief to speak openly about mental health, let alone for a fire chief to admit that they seek the services of a psychologist in order to remain mentally strong and resilient. I want you to know that I feel absolutely no shame, no embarrassment, and no fear in being open about the fact that I work with a psychologist who helps me to remain mentally healthy, strong, and resilient. In fact, my next appointment with him is scheduled for next week, and I'm looking forward to checking in and to make sure that I continue to remain both strong and resilient. In response to the challenges associated with COVID-19, these meetings pivoted from being held in person to online, and I find both formats equally beneficial and effective. I share that with you today in hopes that even one person might feel empowered to reach out or to ask for help to maintain their own mental health or resilience, because if it's okay for me, it's okay for you too. Tomorrow on Bell Let's Talk Day, let's all do our part to raise much needed money for mental health in Canada. Let's also do our part to make conversations about mental health and wellness as common and comfortable as the discussions we have about COVID-19 and other illnesses. Take a minute to check in with the people you care about and to check in with yourself too. 
And if you need help or supports to maintain your health or your health and resilience, seek out that help without fear or hesitation. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and, and thank you for your advocacy. We'll now go to questions. The first up is Mark McAllister from City News. Mark, go ahead, please. Good morning. A uh, question for Dr. Devilla to start. Uh, it's another question that I had asked you a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sure others have as well, with regards to vaccination rates for the age group of 5 to 11. I'm curious, at this point, as of today, we're hearing 53% have received their first dose in Toronto. Again, the trajectory of that line seems to be leveling off compared to 26% at the beginning of December. I'm wondering what more specifically is being done to target parents and caregivers to get those younger people their shot beyond the general outreach and the hyper-local campaigns that you're starting to participate in now. So, Mark, uh, that's a great question. And let me start off with the broader vaccination effort in Toronto and then bring it down to the specifics of the 5 to 11 campaign. So when I look overall at our vaccination efforts here in Toronto, I mean, we are a world leader when it comes to vaccinations, particularly when you look at large municipalities. We have over 90% of our population, as the mayor just mentioned in his remarks this morning, over 90% of our population uh, 12 years of age or older that has a, at least one dose of vaccine on board. Um, and this took some time, absolutely. Uh, and there were parts of the campaign that went very quickly and parts that took a little more time and effort to get there. And I think we're seeing the exact same thing here with our five to 11 year old campaign. Yes, we had a good start and we're continuing to see uptake, but we know that in order to get to the levels of coverage that we would like, we need to use a variety of different strategies. And the good news is that we actually have those strategies at our disposal and we have some success in using them. So part and parcel of that is uh, using a combination of larger immunization clinics along with hyper-local mobile and pop-up clinics to actually get people vaccine opportunities that are convenient and readily accessible to them. Uh, the other component of the campaign obviously involves making sure that people have the information that they need to make good decisions for their children, which in this case means getting the protective benefit of vaccine. So we've held town halls and we have community ambassadors and trusted local partners and agencies who are out there bringing this message directly to parents, uh, to, to uh, you know, those families of five to 11 year olds, their, their parents, their caregivers, their guardians, so that they are able to be informed and can make a good decision. And I think so far, we're seeing a great deal of uptake uh, from people as they get equipped with the information they need to make good health choices and as well, uh, being provided the opportunity to get access to those vaccines in, in ways that make sense for them, that are convenient and are readily accessible. So you're going to see us continue to do that. And I think we will get to where we have gotten um, and continue to maintain that reputation that we have as a world leader when it comes to large mun municipalities and vaccination. Uh, I guess I could um, hone in a little more specifically on the clinics and schools, perhaps. Can we expect to see more clinics specifically at schools in school hours or perhaps directly after school hours where those shots are accessible or more accessible? In a word, yes. Uh, we have already done, uh, last count, we were approaching 300 clinics uh, within school-based settings and there are many more planned. Uh, and this is thanks to the work of all the Team Toronto vaccination partners. Uh, certainly, you know, Toronto Public Health and city staff have been instrumental in this regard, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention all the many partners that are part of that Team Toronto approach. Uh, we deploy our resources together as best as possible, and part of that is school-based clinics, uh, both during school hours and after school hours, trying to make sure that the opportunities for vaccine are convenient uh, both in terms of location and in terms of time. 
So that's exactly the approach that we have taken throughout the vaccination campaign and the kind of approach I think you can count on seeing from us uh, for the future. All right, thank you. We'll go next to David Ryder from the Toronto Star. Dave, go ahead, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, first question, I think, for uh, Mayor Tory, and I'm not sure if there's any city staff on the on the line who want to want to react. We keep seeing all these uh, press releases about the number of streets cleared and the amount of snow, but there is still an ongoing concern about impassable sidewalks and bike lanes. I'm hoping Mayor Tory and anybody else who wants to can talk about the prioritization of vehicle lanes over pedestrian and bike lanes, including we've seen reports of uh, city plows clearing uh, snow from roads into bike lanes. Can you address that, please? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, David. The first thing to note is that, you know, I understand there's some frustration out there uh, in some quarters, and uh, we're dealing here with uh, one of the top five storms the city's ever experienced in its history and with the single largest snow removal operation in history. Uh, the other reality that I, of course, have learned in the course of this storm and others is that it's not completely interchangeable, the equipment that you could use. So you can't just say, well, let's have every single piece of equipment devoted to uh, any one of the elements of snow clearing. There's different pieces of equipment. There's different districts of the city. Uh, but there has been uh, a clear priority placed by me, and I meet with the staff on this every day, uh, to make sure that all of the different uh, public spaces that are required by the public to get around and to live their lives, uh, including sidewalks, uh, uh, street, uh, street, uh, streets, and, uh, and uh, bike lanes, uh, as in addition to school zones and bus stops, uh, are all uh, being treated with uh, a huge amount of dedication and effort. And I want to take this moment to say thank you to the people that have been doing this work because they have been working 24-7. They continue to work 24-7. And when you look at you know, the list that I get that are literally, these are the locations uh, of places where snow removal is taking place. Uh, and I would just say to people that one of the things they could do to help us uh, beyond their patience, which I thank them for again, uh, is to call 311 if there are particular hot spots, whether it is a sidewalk location, whether it is a school zone or a, a bike lane, and let us know. Uh, we're accumulating, obviously, because of the people who have been kind enough to call um, places where we're going, and we're, we're getting at them uh, each and every day. But uh, it is uh, obviously a safety and other priority for us to clear uh, sidewalks and to uh, do that at the same time as we're doing uh, the other pieces of public space that uh, people expect us to have clear. Barbara Gray, our uh, General Manager of Transportation Services, if she can just expand on a prioritization, for example. Barbara? Thank you. Um, I, I uh, Thanks, David, for the question. I uh, We are dealing with um, all of the components of our snow clearing and removal. Uh, I think part of the challenge with a storm this big, and, and we continue to say we've seen we haven't seen a storm this large with this much snow in quite some time. It's about five times a, a normal storm. And when you get windrows that high, especially in between various components of the road, the sidewalk, the bike lane, uh, very often actions happen, whether it's by the city uh, to clear one thing over the as well as the other, or it's by uh, adjacent residents or businesses moving snow to try to get uh, areas outside clear that these things do move in blocks. So we, we're uh, constantly needing to go back and address locations multiple times, and we continue to do that. And I uh, agree with the mayor that all those locations need to continue to come into 311. They're getting prioritized and addressed, uh, and we are still at a 24 7. The follow up, Dave? Yeah, pardon me. Um, I think uh, this one may be for Dr. Davila. I'm hoping uh, she can just give us any kind of update on uh, the COVID situation. Are we still seeing a, fl a flattening or any change with wastewater? I think we might hear about that this week. And also if there are any extra um, precautions or, or rules uh, envisioned for Toronto to help uh, keep the Omicron wave low. So thanks, David. Uh, I would say that at this point in time, looking at our overall COVID-19 situation, we're seeing reason to be cautiously optimistic. And that's how I would characterize my uh, particular perspective on COVID-19 at this time. Uh, one, cautious because we are still seeing some impact on our healthcare system. Uh, one only needs to talk to our partners, particularly in acute care, uh, to see that there are still a number of strains being experienced within healthcare. 
and our numbers of those in hospital and those in ICU continue to be uh, relatively high. So there's still some reason for, for some caution and, and um, you know, some careful observation. But certainly there's reason for optimism as well. We are seeing some indicators that are telling us that things are getting a little bit better. Wastewater surveillance being one of them. We've seen some uh, declines uh, over the past uh, few weeks at this point. And we'll be uh, making sure that those indicators, the wastewater surveillance indicator, is provided on our dashboard for the public to follow along with us. Uh, as well, we are seeing uh, the overall number of active confirmed outbreaks in the various settings that exist throughout the city also starting to, to tail off. Um, so to my mind, this is reason for cautious optimism and for us to continue the important work that we're doing right now. From our perspective, that means making sure that we're providing all those opportunities for people to get the protective benefit of vaccine and of course, we ask uh, the residents of Toronto to continue to be vigilant in respect of those things that they can do to reduce uh, the transmission of COVID-19. Part of that will be getting vaccine for those who have yet to get vaccine or are eligible for subsequent doses. The other components, of course, include choosing those moments to interact with other people carefully where there is a choice. Uh, masking, uh, using ventilation, using all the knowledge I referred to in my remarks today that we've acquired over the past two years to good effect. And I think that if we continue to do that, uh, we've seen the benefit it's had thus far, and the more we're able to do those things, the more benefit we'll continue to see in the future. I thank you. We'll go next to Momin Qureshi from City News uh, 680. Mo, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. This one is for Dr. Davila. Uh, Dave kind of touched on what I wanted to ask there, um, but just to follow up on that, uh, with some of the restrictions being lifted next week and the data that we have that shows we're at uh, more than 90% of uh, people over 12 with one dose, almost 90% of two dose, uh, and that we can see that the Omicron variant, while spreading quickly, uh, does seem to have a less impact on the majority of people who are fully vaccinated. I just wanted to get your take on how confident people should be uh, returning to indoor dining, movies, that kind of thing, when we see that the data plus vaccinations uh, seem to say that people will be all right and that they should go on experience with things. So, Momin, thanks for the question. It was a little bit uh, muffled at the end, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer just the same. So, uh, as I mentioned in the answer to the previous question, uh, we have reason to be cautiously optimistic. Right? We are seeing some indications uh, that are demonstrating that activity, COVID-19 transmission and activity, is actually declining or reducing within our community. And this is a good thing. Uh, we are, however, still dealing with some significant impacts associated with COVID-19 virus, uh, notably what's happening within our healthcare system and the demands that are placed on our hospitals in particular, but all other aspects of our healthcare system as well. So to my mind, uh, recognizing that we are, um, you know, a few days away from the loosening of some restrictions, what we have seen has worked in the past few weeks continues to be important, right? So I ask that Torontonians continue to put all the lessons we've learned over the last two years and the lessons uh, and the practices that we've been using for the past few weeks now, particularly uh, since the arrival of Omicron, to good use. So we're, we're doing well, right? We're seeing good progress on the basis of what we've been doing to date the combination of vaccine and using all our knowledge and all the tools at our disposal to reduce COVID-19 transmission. Even as we move towards the uh, relaxing of some restrictions under provincial regulations next week, it's still important that we continue to heed all those lessons learned and that we use those tools to good use. So I would continue to encourage people, please get vaccinated. If your children are not yet vaccinated, please get them vaccinated. If you are vaccinated, perhaps you can help somebody else who's not yet fully vaccinated to get there. These, I think, are the kinds of things that can really make a difference and help us continue to see the progress that we've made to date, particularly in this Omicron wave. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't remind people, if you are sick, 
please stay home. It is the best thing uh, that, that can be done in terms of reducing transmission, particularly where we know there's some risk there. So that, along with all the other pieces of advice, you know, limiting interactions, uh, you know, making sure that you're using masking and distancing and ventilation to good effect, along with vaccine, all of this we know really does make a difference. So to my mind, I think as we reflect back on the two years that has been and what we would like to see in the future, I would encourage people to, to really focus on, on what we know has worked over these past two years and to continue to use those tools to good effect. Great, thanks so much. And uh, my follow-up is to Mayor Tory along the same lines with uh, things reopening this week, next week. Uh, if what you think the city's role should be in terms of uh, encouraging people to go back out and to, to patronize those places, uh, albeit safely. I didn't hear the question. I, I just was muffled like Dr. Yeah, Lowe said. Uh, Mo, could you just repeat it? Maybe if you could just shorten it a bit. We're having trouble hearing you. I think you're asking about reopening. Moment, you there? I think, Mayor, he was uh, he was just asking about uh, encouraging people to to go back out uh, on reopening and, and and sort of some comments on that. We uh, obviously are going to be following the provincial regulations, as will the businesses involved and the different places uh, to go. We'll have more to say in the coming days about some of the resumption of uh, city uh, programs uh, that have been closed as a result of the provincial regulations. But I think the watchword for us will be uh, to be cautious, to be careful, to not just look at the you know pure numbers involved in the regulations themselves with regard to capacity limits, but to be careful in the ways that Dr. Davila has suggested continuously uh, throughout the pandemic uh, with regard to interaction with other people, masking, and so forth. As a city, we will be operating some programs as we go forward, um, like the Winterlicious type program that we've done. We have to sort of make sure we're uh, in a situation where that program can be most effectively offered in terms of the timing of it. But we'll be doing some things like that in order to help promote uh, people uh, using and patronizing and supporting uh, local businesses, including but not limited to restaurants, other shops as well, because they've all been hard hit by this. And we'll be uh, introducing some of those programs as uh, seems appropriate in light of the uh, the timing of uh, things opening up. All right, thank you very much. That uh, concludes the uh, reporters on our line and therefore our questions in today's briefing. Please stay well, everybody. Thank you.